Okay. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this afternoon's program. Uh, we are having here a roundtable discussion with the title How Not to Own, with not in brackets, from commons to property. So this roundtable discussion will address the following questions. Capitalism is often seen as a system relying on exclusive conception of private property, whilst commons are by the same token seen as relating to collective wealth. But to what extent are these definitions taken for granted? The roundtable will address several issues related to the topics, the destruction of the first commons in early capitalism and the need to broaden their definition to social relations, as well as the need to include notions of wealth beyond the market. Then the question of the different conceptions of property, so the question of whether only private property is compatible with capitalism or the situation is more complex. The critique of the ways in which property relations are conceptualized today and of how their control is conditioned by the contradictions of contemporary capitalism. And the panel will also touch upon more specific questions like the distribution of food and its role as a commons. So we have here with us four participants, and these are Giuseppe Mastruzzo from the International University College in Torino, Vladen Lazic from the Faculty of Philosophy of the University of Belgrade, Tony Prug from Queen Mary University of London, and Jovan Babic, also from the Faculty of Philosophy of the University of Belgrade. So I will first give the word to all four speakers who will have brief points on these issues and then we will have a discussion between the participants and then if there is more time left we can open the general discussion. So without further ado I would like to give the word to Tony Prug and invite him to, to start the roundtable discussion. Um, um, maybe not so typical for, uh, for the format, but I'll start with a critique and I'll try to keep it brief as much as I can. Um, uh, two years ago, I was invited to the Green Academy at V Island in Croatia. I had something prepared for commons. Uh, but then uh, people next to me on the panel, uh, the way they use commons, the concept provoked me so much and uh, seeing the panel that this was the first liberated area in Europe and so on and so on and you know, having grandfathers who fought for socialism for whatever reasons. Uh, I scrapped what I had and I had a brief presentation called Ten Facts and Commons. And it was pretty much fuck the commons without workers, uh, fuck the commons without work at uh, uh, factories, Fuck the commons without food production, but I would say monetized and abstractly made universally available through some form that allows general uh, general distribution, uh, which is not exchanging potatoes as they do in Greeks in local uh, local uh, farm places or anything similar to that, uh, because it's not sustainable. Not because I think it's wrong or or because I think it's uh, uh, it's just not it doesn't scale. It doesn't scale, it doesn't allow science, it doesn't allow economics, and it doesn't allow, um, most importantly, egalitarian approaches to wealth, which is distribution according to need and production according to need, which, which means, in the simplest possible terms, you produce goods which are either planned or are allocated afterwards based on demand. We've seen both in history. Uh, we've seen one in East Europe, uh, in socialist countries, we see today to an extent in China, we see it in Venezuela, but more than anything, we see it in uh, what's normally in liberal theories called welfare state in the West. Uh, but what we actually have, in my view, in welfare state is a different social form of product. So uh, there, of course, I refer in Marxian tradition, we have a uh, division of labor, which is monetized, we have even a central bank, we may have had, well, until the 80s, we had most of the banks in Europe were not privately owned. Um, production is planned roughly in, in advance, i.e. you know how many 
uh, medical schools you have or you know you have quotas for students or you have teachers and so on and so on so to an extent uh, education and health are uh, planned for example but housing used to be planned 70 percent of it was owned by uh, local authorities in britain in early 70s uh, and then that product it's not a commodity uh, it's what uh, in classical economics, wrongly calls commodity because they don't have a concept of social element of production. All they have is the resisting Marx laugh at it, calling chit chat about goods. The found in 150 years ago, uh, uh, later, still chit chat about goods. People still talk about production as if there is only one form of production. And if there's any lesson we can draw from Marx, it's probably all schools, from orthodox ones to the value form ones to whatever one you want to choose to agree, there's something called social form of production, i.e. production is denaturalized. It is specific historically to a certain area, to a certain way of producing it. Um, so public health and public education, public housing are products, which are not commodities, uh, which cost money, and they produce surplus, which doesn't appear in monetary form, because they free other people from labor. Uh, better example is kindergarten where if you take care of kids, if one person takes care of 10 kids, then those parents can do something else. That is called surplus labor. What you do with that surplus labor, when you monetize it, and then you get surplus value, i.e. you get profits in capitalist production, is one thing. If you're a public sector, then you pool the resources, you tax people, and then you pay for the person. And then those, there is still surplus showing in the garden. 10 parents are able to do something else. They don't have to take care of the children. Now, the reason I'm telling you all of this is because the, what a lot of the times when I read the Commons uh, uh, literature, uh, and I'm seriously, seriously only delved into it once, uh, uh, Sally who invited me here told me, oh, look, this looks interesting, why don't you give us an abstract on this? And I ended up spending a week reading pretty much Ostrom's uh, work from, from the start. Uh, what you find is that um, neoclassical Terms are fully accepted. Eleanor Rostrom completely accepts. She's clear about it. There is no doubt throughout her work. She never left it, not the latest works. And maybe that's why they gave her a Nobel Prize. Who knows? I mean, if you, if you say that all production that happens through markets is fine, let's leave those theories. Uh, she collaborated with Buchanan. She collaborated with some of the biggest figures of neoclassical economics in, in her earlier works. Uh, all she focuses on is natural resources, man-made, so they can be part of what is normally called the first state of public sector, uh, or simply natural resources per se, a, a river protected from, from overuse. Uh, so the reason I'm telling you all this is because I don't see at all how commons as a concept fits in a Marxist framework or in a more broadly egalitarian work, uh, framework of uh, wealth production that the social democratic, quite liberal pro-capitalist views could subscribe to. Um, and I'm hoping that someone will you know, enlighten me and I'll, I'll start seeing something more in it than a delay of, of left to go back to its roots, which is to show that production, monetized production that employs people, pays people and distributes based on labor or based on basic income, which is another concept of, of extension of allocation according to needs, which then has to be spent on markets, so it has its drawbacks. Uh, so I'm highly skeptical, uh, skeptical and I'm hoping that I will hear here something that will, uh, that will uh, open me to different views. There are people like Dyer Villefort and there are, there are people who theorize commons in, in what I see as constructive um, in a constructive way from the left. So, for example, a quote from Dyer Beautiful, uh, Turbulence, the piece from 2007, a common is a good produced or conserved to be shared. With solidarity, economies create experimental, collectively managed forms of productions. Now, call me mental if you want, but solidarity economies that create experimental, collectively managed forms of production, that sounds like communism to me, or socialism, whatever you want to call it, or even welfare state, even that was an attempt. So when Labour born in 1945 in Britain, the way they brought the NHS forward was to say, we will categorize the whole of the UK, meaning we will provide health service according to need to every single citizen. 
based on the principle uh, Wales miners from Tredegar, a small, small town, where they were collecting the money for 100 years together and paying people according to need. I, you need a doctor, we'll, we'll hire a doctor and they will take care of you. So collective, uh, collective use of goods, experimental at the time, uh, and that's what they call socialism. And labor, uh, a lot of labor politicians back then called themselves socialists. I mean, I'm a bad bedman who was minister of health at the time, he called himself a socialist. So, to finish, what I'm saying is, there is this thing called, unfortunately, economics. Right, it was called political economics. Then it was called economics when the revolution from the marginal utility lot came in classical different ways. Then there is a Marx reaction rate to the critique of political economy. And then we had socialist experiments that lasted for 50, 60, 70 years, and there's still some bastard version of it in China going on. Or, I mean, if you want to call uh, Latin American experiments to be left experiments of some kind. There are goods that are produced that are not capitalist goods, so they're not commodities, so we can't call them goods, they're something else. And I think if we limit ourselves only to natural resources, the whole discourse of commons is simply cornered in a tiny, tiny ecos, surely important corner of the world, but it tells us nothing about uh, the general issue of labor, money, production, allocation of, of products, and how they can differ from capitalist mode of production, from, from commodities, from profit-driven and surplus-value-driven production. And once we start seeing that in commons discourse, I'll be the first to put my head down and write a piece on commons, because I think uh, that is the way to continue with uh, theories that stopped as an ideological boundary in 1991 when the East Europe uh, fell apart and then socialism is game way to democratic uh, revolutions. So thanks, and I'm hoping to hear something more constructive. Uh, <coughs> thanks, Tony. I'll now give the word to Giuseppe Mastruzzo from the University, International University College in Torino. Okay, thank you. I, uh, I'd like to follow up on the intergenerational uh, solidarity uh, across so well explained and introduce an element of time because I think the problem we have is that we, since we can't broaden up to our children, then we can't see the other people and peoples in place at present. And that the two things, uh, I think, the two things are uh, interconnected. You can't have one solidarity without the other. And so we should kind of introduce this element of time. And, you know, I would have been uh, a little more uncertain in my uh, steps a week ago, and then something happened uh, last Thursday. Last Thursday, I got the imprimatur by the Pope. The Pope uh, published, uh, as you possibly know, the encyclical letter, Laudato Si, uh, which is surprising. Uh, uh, in its uh, text, and as I encourage me, uh, as I encourage myself to uh, read it, I encourage you to do it. Uh, it's a, a uh, text which is anti-capitalist anti in essence, and why is it? The first thing that our friend uh, introduces in his text is an element of time. You know, we are all mortal in this room. Some of us can have a different perception of themselves, but that is the point. And, uh, while, you know, in Europe now we have, uh, we have it already uh, near the ocean, in Europe we have a legal person who's not mortal. You know, corporations are not. And since we recognize to them rights that were meant for mortal people, all of a sudden we have a different, if you want, distorted, because uh, um, Pope Francis uh, denounced it as uh, perverse, uh, a different perception of what a person can do with uh, his or her property. You know. um, we have this uh, famous little line from Leviticus that said, 
you can't, you shall not sell the land in perpetuity, so you can't sell it definitively, okay? The land can't be yours definitively, but now you know all of a sudden we have this possibility. We have the possibility of an immortal owner. And to stay uh, at the subject, which is uh, commons and property and why uh, they uh, are at odds, or are they, I uh, want to uh, try and explore with you why the commons challenge this. They challenge this element of time, they challenge the uh, possibility even of an absolute uh, property. And why is it? And again, uh, our friend Pope Francis is uh, extremely deft in, its, uh, in his text, because he says, um, he says, the church has never, ever uh, permitted any inviolable understanding of property, he says. And then he says, there is a social mortgage, I'm uh, quoting, uh, you know, literally, there is a social mortgage on private property. And you know, uh, this is in a text which is addressed to millions of people, so all of a sudden we have the basis to call, without being visionary even, just uh, acknowledging a text which is already there, uh, to call for a social mortgage on global property. We can call for a social mortgage on global property. We can freely say, guys, Limits on property are even logic. They are the basis of any possible human relationship. So this element of time is something which has been introduced from the beginning when we talk about uh, the commons, commoning. We always say, uh, guys, we don't have exclusive property, not even as the whole of present humankind because we are limited insofar as we want to um, give all this which we have on loan, give all this to a, a future uh, generation. So to do this, to guarantee this element of time, to protect this element of time, I think that there is a need to establish systems of uh, governance of uh, global commons. And again, you know, I'm uh, quoting literally the encyclical letter. Uh, he says that uh, there is a need to establish systems of governance for the so-called global commons. So again, we are at this. We have nothing less as a uh, task today than to call for this new social mortgage established in a system of governance which is global. Thanks a lot, Giuseppe. <laughs> um, and I would now like to give the word to Professor Mladen Lazic. Okay, I hope I will also be brief, in, at least in this first round. Uh, and I will be probably quiet, I even if you I'm inclined to, to, to uh, uh, speak about the same topic we are going to, uh, I am going to talk about the problems uh, called Krug race. Uh, and I want to address the problem, what is the real relationship between the capitalism and private property and capitalism and other forms, forms of property, public property, or uh, state, like state property, or institutional property, or commons, and so on and so forth. I mean, many misunderstandings for years, for decades, are coming from, the, in, in my view, uh, not uh, also misunderstanding of this of this relationship, and uh, from the idea that uh, if you transform one property form into another one, you will change the system. If you privatize then you will have capitalism. If you make private property kind of public property, you will change the capitalism. And I think this is, this is in principle, wrong, wrong approach. 
and much uh, fuss which was raised uh, uh, around the prioritization, reprioritization or statization was wrongly addressed. Anyway, I start with the uh, uh, Marx view that what property is is kind of legal or institutional form of social relations and we have to look all the time into social relations to see what specific type of property really means. Uh, what first we can of course start with the definition of capitalism. Is a capitalism society based on private property? If this is the case, if this has been the case, then we, we, we have had capitalism since ancient times to, to the present. And in the Roman Empire, or even before, in, in ancient Greeks, in, in ancient Greek, the private property was one of the dominant forms, or even the dominant form of property. So this is nothing to the private property as such. It's only one very adequate form for capitalism, but it's not where capitalism begins or ends. Uh, if we look into, into discussions uh, raised uh, during the first big uh, capitalist crisis in the 19th century, in 1930s, there you see that these discussions were also uh, were developing up, uh, on the problems of, of property forms. Was the, the at that time the corporativization, so to say, the, the, the increase of companies made on, on corporate property? Was this the kind of uh, uh, making non-capitalist society as some theoreticians thought. Was this kind of managerial revolution? So there, can, there were two processes. One is the corporatization, which is not anything new in capitalism. With, with corporations, capitalism started, started in, in the 17th century. Company means shared, people who share bread. So the very first form of capitalist property was not private as property as individual one, but was kind of shared property. Uh, so the corporate uh, it doesn't matter how many owners are in the company, it doesn't matter who are the owners. What matters is what are the social relations of domination inside the property form. And corporations behave as capitalist entities uh, as much as, as any kind of individually uh, owned property uh, defines the, 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 uh, the capitalist form of, of production. The same goes with managerial uh, uh, the, the managers in, 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 in the corporation. It doesn't matter who runs the corporation. What matters is how co corporations managerially run corporations behave, and they behave in, in, in a capitalist way. Then we come to another problem, the problem which was raised in, in after the Second World War, and it is statization. Does statization, this statization mean the, the abolishment of capitalism? Of course not. Any kind of public property operating inside the capitalist relations, inside the relations of domination, remains capitalist form of property. Uh, the, the, what is the state? Is the state a kind of, a, of general ad, uh, organization of, of, of the society as such? Or is the state an instrument of the dominant group in the capital? So if the state is an instrument of the capitalist class, how then state property, this kind of public property, may represent a kind of abolishment of capital? Is the uh, Friedrich Engels uh, factory in the 19th century, Robert Owens factories, were non capitalist factories? Are Mondragon in Spain or, or uh, factories uh, in Arge Argentina, are they non capitalist factories because they're owned by, uh, run by workers? No, they, they are capitalist enterprises because they work inside the, the capitalist social relations. So the same goes to the commons. Is the, is the air 
Is the air, is the water something which belongs to every, everyone in capital? No. We breathe different airs, we drink different waters if we are rich or, we, or, or, or poor. And so, until the, these basic capitalist relations are not changed, any kind of property may go with capitalism. Thank you very much, Professor Vazic. And our last speaker is Professor Joran Babic. Thank you, Marian. I hope we had a different uh, approach or uh, and uh, also hope that uh, my philosophical and analy analytical uh, stand will not be too boring. Uh, my main uh, uh, standpoint to property is uh, Kantian. It, it's uh, based in the original, uh, uh, so-called original property, which comes from the freedom. Uh, freedom, as you may know, is the basic uh, notion in Kantian practical, practical philosophy. Uh, uh, and the freedom uh, consists in a power or capacity to realize set ends uh, uh, and to be able to do that, you have to use some means to do that. So uh, persons have a right to use things for the purpose of the realization of the ends they set. But without property, uh, usage of, the, of those beings would be uncertain and unpredictable. Of course, that means that property is a very basic uh, uh, institution, which is one of the most, the, the strongest ones uh, that we uh, uh, have at all. Uh, the normative position uh, made by a single fact of owning is changing the whole world, changing the nor nor normative position of all others being exclusive. So we may ask what can be owned? Can we own a fact? If we made that distinction between persons and, and things, uh, it might be feasible to say uh, that things can be owned and persons couldn't, which is, excludes slavery and perhaps also discrimination and many other uh, abuses. But can you, can you uh, own a fact or an information? We are speaking of, let's say, copyright. Uh, is, uh, there is a case of reading a web page. Does it count as a, as a copying, which might seem to be a kind of of property, or perhaps the, pa the, the patents, which are introducing a new pattern in the in the uh, in what property is. I'll uh, read you a short uh, case uh, of this, uh, perhaps new, but actually the, the same logic is present all the time. Uh, of this uh, this question, what can be owned, but perhaps shouldn't. Uh, in the forests of Panama lives a Guayamin Indian woman who is unusually resistant to a virus that causes leukemia. Uh, she was discovered by scientific so-called gene hunters engaged in seeking out native peoples whose lives and cultures are threatened with extinction. Though they provided bas basic medical care, the hunters did not set out to preserve the people, only their genes which can be kept in cultures of immortalized cell. I, I'll have a question for Giuseppe, uh, for Giuseppe regarding immor uh, immortality later. Uh, so we, those uh, genes can be kept in cultures of immortalized cells grown in the laboratory. In 1993, uh, so more than 20 years ago, the US Department of Commerce tried to patent the Guayami women's genes and only abandoned. Uh, they, can't hear, they can't hear you very well in the background, so maybe we should like. Uh, Speak louder. A bit louder. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, so in 1993, the US Department of Commerce tried to patent the Guayami women's, uh, women's genes and only abandoned the attempt in the face of furious protests from representatives of the indigenous uh, people. So we have an issue uh, uh, of what can be 
uh, the subject of property or in uh, the way that Deborah Sal, uh, Satz from uh, uh, Stanford uh, uh, phrased it, why some things should not be for sale uh, or are we having some reasons to block certain uh, parts of our uh, possibility to sell and buy things in the free market and certain parts of the market to exclude? Perhaps it, it, it would be better to uh, speak in a market, in, in terminological markets, markets in, in plural, uh, markets in apples and cars or, or, or houses is very different from, let's say, markets in human organs, reprodu reproductive services, she adds diamonds, which produces uh, curious wars, etc. Pass in the end. Uh, she also mentioned sex, which is questionable, of course, weapons, life-saving medicines, and also credit uh, derivatives. I would add uh, something more than that. If we uh, go to the start and uh, uh, say that the, the freedom is the capacity to set uh, ends and uh, attempt to realize those ends, we may say that life is the activity of actualization of the freedom and the process of uh, realization of set, uh, set ends, and that's done through the work. And work is something that uh, uh, consists of uh, producing some results based on the opportunities uh, which are actually out there or they may not, uh, not be out there. There is work or there is not work there. Uh, it cannot be just conceived or imagined. So uh, one of the main problems here uh, besides the problem what, of the limits or, or, or uh, demarcation lines within the concept of the property uh, seems to me in connection with the topic of the conference, capitalism and society, is that uh, owning might become the owning of the opportunities to work, which actually is the introducing the property always some uh, over the lives of some other, uh, some other people. The lives of others are becoming a kind of property of those who make decisions about the opportunities, their existence, and their distribution. And that's the, uh, the story of the managers. Managers are deciding, uh, deciding uh, about the work in the first place, and then who is going to, uh, to get to that. And work is a product requisite of the life. So the life is becoming uh, a kind of, of, of property, which leads a very curious uh, perspective, uh, possibly in the future, uh, which might be described in the following way. It, it may happen that the whole humankind will divide into uh, disproportionately unequal parts. One, the owners of the world, so uh, to say, and the others uh, which are waiting to be given the chance to set some ends in their lives. Uh, it's easy to conceive that in the, uh, under some conditions of welfare and the advancement of the technology makes possible uh, such things easily actually, that everybody would uh, uh, receive some um, uh, some, let's say, decent sum uh, of, of money or, or, or resources uh, enough to maintain their lives and uh, be ready uh, there to, uh, uh, to do anything that, could, uh, that they could be asked or requested to do, being all the time on call. If we uh, look around, we may see that uh, working places or uh, salaries or things like that are uh, losing uh, its reality and the work and the primordial, the old scheme of employment and, at will uh, has been reintroduced uh, through uh, uh, institutes of deadline, tasks, projects and things like that, making uh, most of the humankind on call and working only part time, uh, which might be depicted as producing a new kind of huge lumpen proletariat usable as a resources, resources, human resources, that's very interesting uh, voting, 
uh, for whichever uh, purpose they could be used, uh, decided by those who own the world and the, uh, those people uh, also. So that's just a possible uh, projection of the or future projection of, of capitalism. If that's true, or if that gets through, if that uh, uh, come to be realized, it will show the, uh, the uh, huge adjustability of this most basic economic scheme, which is actually uh, invested or, or to be found in, in the market. Uh, and that's uh, uh, that uh, uh, everything is becoming the, the commodity. Uh, commons, uh, private property, uh, using the uh, means to realize uh, certain and everything would become uh, in a way uh, a matter of illusion of the freedom. And that illusion of the freedom might be very pleasant, but in the end uh, it would be uh, sacrificing uh, the freedom for the sake of happiness. And happiness might prevail over two other basic uh, values, freedom and justice. Thank you very much, Professor Babic. So now we will have the reactions of all speakers to each other's presentations. So I'll first invite Tony Pruk to, to start the discussion by commenting on, on other participants' presentations. Tony. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's start first. Uh, Professor Lazarus, because you directly uh, gave a, 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 what I would say is a classical Marxist view of how Marx was read that uh, once state took over uh, some production, it became embedded in the capitalist society. So, for example, welfare state was simply a, uh, an expense on surplus value from generated in, in a capitalist country. Uh, yes, that's a, that's a classical reading of Marx. I can't I can't disagree with that. But but uh, it's uh, today it's, I think it's a wrong one, and I think it's been a wrong, it's been a wrong one for a long long time. And I think that Soviet Marxists were on their way to to figure out, but for whatever reason they didn't. Um, so let me just try to, to put it because. Um, so this is a letter he published in Science and Society in uh, uh, 1944 from Lenti and 10 other uh, Marxists from Soviet Union. Quote, the matter has been often presented as though the surplus product, i.e. product over the subsidence, I mean what's, what's required to reproduce the same generation of people, does not exist under socialism. Um, which is of course quite wrong. Surplus labor, labor over and above, what is necessary for the immediate personal needs of the workers must always exist under any system of society. Uh, a certain part of the product of social labor must be systematically devoted to purposes of accumulation, even under socialism. And then he finishes, or they finish, a certain portion of the surplus labor goes towards realization of such rights of Soviet citizens as the right of education, the maintenance of the schools, universities and libraries, the right to rest, sanatoria and rest homes in brackets, the right to security during sickness and old age in brackets, hospitals, pharmacies and homes. If they finish uh, the more like a letter than an academic piece, thus in socialist society, surplus product is at the disposal of society as a whole for the satisfaction of all social needs and demands. Uh, so what he was saying here, what he wasn't saying is that they had a product, which was not commodity. And at Marx, at during Marx's life, UK statistics, I, I've looked at them, I've looked at others, but UK had the best that were available to me. There was nothing in state production other than oppression. You had military, police, and courts. That's it, some roads, very, very poor roads, water supply, very, very poor. Uh, 0, 0.02 of GDP was health, education, pension, but that didn't exist. Uh, when Mars died, they went from 0.02 to 0.04. Basically, this non-commodity form of production, which is not for profit, didn't exist during Marx's time. So we can't blindly read Marx and say we will find the truth about public sector outputs. It's not there. The only period that's there is a neoclassical one. And we know what is it. There is a period that says that the rule of the markets is the absolute and the more the market, the merrier, the better, the more we the better. 
And I, I completely agree with you that simply uh, taking over some production by the state um, or public body or local authority is not going to solve the issue. Uh, but it will eat into commodity production if it is allocated according to need, not a small, short mental exercise. Let's say we nationalize all food production, in, not in Serbia because we are not, Serbia can't survive, so no small country can. In Europe, let's say we nationalize all food production and we allocate food according to need. No more money, no more value, no more surplus value, simply you need food, you go to shop and you take it. That seems crazy and unimaginable, but that's how healthcare and education were put in practice. That's how social housing to an extent, because you still have to pay some part of the rent, it was part according to your individual. So what I'm saying is that the, the property, for me, is the wrong angle to look at uh, the problem that commons literature wants to address. And it is form of social wealth or product, output, production. Common literature doesn't talk about labor, doesn't talk about work, doesn't talk about role of money. Uh, it cannot, it, for some reason, it kind of goes around those issues and sometimes only bury for this, but there are traces. So I'll, I'll quote, this is, um, and I'll finish my comment, this, this is uh, Bollier and Hilfrich, uh, uh, David Bollier and Silke Hilfrich, Introduction to Commons of Transformative Value, reader from 2012, just after the, after maybe even some of it written and cooked at the least uh, uh, resonance. So it says, quote, they want to see commons as a discourse that transforms and remakes the categories of the prevailing political and economic order, right? It transcends the categories and remakes. Now, if you want to transcend and remake categories of political and economic order, you need to be at least as bold as socialists and communists of the part were, if not more, because you've got finance where you have several hundred times of the GDP of kind of value because it's not liquid, you can't transfer it into money. Floating in cloud, i.e. in markets, financial markets. So you've got to be a lot bolder today with your theoretical uh, uh, foundation to do the same. And they finish. They said they want, this is again a quote from Hill Freak and Bullier, to provide us with a new socially constructed order of experience, an elemental political worldview, and a persuasive grand narrative. Now what was socialism in East Europe if not a persuasive grand narrative. And what was it if it wasn't a new socially constructed order of experience? It wasn't the ideal one. It wasn't the one that lasted very long. Well, 70 years is not too bad. It wasn't pretty at times uh, at all. But it had transformed a lot of the basic foundational issues that Commons writers, some of the key ones, the editors of both of the a very good reader. I mean, it's a very inspirational reader, this one from 2012. But that reader, again, sometimes takes a little bit of Ostrom, which is really neoclassical. I mean, Ostrom says, anything that can be allocated via markets is neoclassical. Neoclassical theory is dealing with it. It's fine. Let's leave it to those guys. We will deal with fisheries, with lakes, with, sorry, fisheries, lakes don't matter. They're a tiny fraction of wealth and uh, value production, I monetized production, through which we live. And that's why we have the basic income as a demand, because once we redistribute value, we are redistributing our ability to participate in, in surplus product. And I quoted this Soviet letter from 44, a uh, piece in, because these were the Soviet Marxists at the time saying to the Western Marxists, enough of your interpretations of how we restructured our world, this is how we run it, there is surplus product, and we redistribute. We give wealth, we, we give education, we give health. So, what I'm wondering is, and this is a question for the, for the other three speakers, and I'll finish is, do you see any other social form of wealth, a product, an output, where laborers come together, whoever organizes them, and they produce something, and then it's allocated or distributed, not on profit basis, so it's non-capitalist in that sense, that can be seen as a germ element of, of commons? Thank you very much, Tony. I now invite Professor Lazic to uh, first respond to Tony's questions and then give his own comments and questions and other speakers' presentations. Uh, yeah, oh. it's, a, it's a really strange situation in which, in general, I mean, your arguments are in line with the, with the uh, neoliberals. And they also, the position also is that the statization means the abolition of capital. Civilization started in some countries extremely earlier. 
in, in Portugal, in the 17th century state, built the ships of merchants, in, in Venice too. And, and uh, in all in different countries, in, in different times, and the proportion of state ownership uh, very, very much. Uh, and nothing changed in, in the general framework of capital production. According to early, early the theoretical language, the state should be destroyed in order to make a new kind of society. According to late practical way, the state, state might be used as an instrument for making a new society. And where this state finished? And what was the outcome of this process of state intervention? What was the new type of domination? I don't know. I don't want to say this kind of domination was more uh, I mean, friendly to workers or, 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 or not, or to middle class people, but it was certainly not uh, a, a new type of domination, not, not of uh, any, any society closer to the, to the, I don't know how real social, or, or the, the original idea of social, to, to, to society of equality of, uh, and not, not domination. So uh, the, 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 the fact that uh, the state is a kind, kind of, uh, as I said, you can answer like basic comment on state. The state is an instrument from the dominant group. But is it possible that, I mean, and what was the, the what was the politics, economic poli policies of, of, the, of the state in social democratic countries? To socialize costs, socialize some costs which were necessary for the, for the capitalist production. To make them cheaper and secure the, the necessary form of labor. Educate, more educated labor, labor and more, more healthy labor. And this is good, of course, for the, for the labor as such, but this is not, that it doesn't mean it is not capitalist money. You know, like higher living standard does not mean, we, a general higher living standard does not mean that we are closer to socialist type of society. Does that mean that we are in different type of society? What was the basis of the attack on the neoliberals, uh, the attack on the state by neoliberals? They, they didn't, I, I might, in my view, they attacked nations, nation state, not state as such. They wanted some kind of international uh, freedom and international regulation in process. Not, not the abolishment of any kind of regulation because they know very well that some kind of regulation is necessary, but not any, any more national, national regulation but national state. So, I, I think that uh, I mean, this is really, this is the, the, the dead end of this. I mean, the idea that you may use the given instrument, six, um, six instruments given by the present society, and use them for making an one. There are the, the elements of, 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 of course. I agree with basic, with basic starting point of the idea of, of, of let's say, of, of commerce. This is kind of utopian critique which is necessary, which is necessary for the change of society. And then the, the, the same, uh, I mean, the structure of the relationship should be, should be made certain from this, from this point. And you cannot say, you cannot say that these uh, points are changed inside the society. They be, be the starting point of all elements of the society, or of the new society. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, now uh, the word to Giuseppe Mastuzzo to give his comments. Uh, sorry, yeah, my question, uh, my co general comment on, on, on your question. I, I, I very often I, I, I have discussions about the, the new Coke and his progressive text, uh, views and so on and so forth, but my, my reservation is the following one. Until he abolished Banca Catolica, he will not be socialist. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm not going to uh, be the defensor Fide uh, and I'm not going to defend Pope Francis. I don't care, by the way. <laughs> Let me state this uh, very clearly. Uh, but uh, I still encourage you to read that text. Mm -hmm. and now, I would get back to this uh, little word uh, which we are kind of uh, putting aside, which is property, because I think that is the crux of the matter, you see. I mean, uh, and it is what makes private and public sometimes two dangerous term, terms equally, okay? 
because you are asking, for instance, uh, what kind of social relations found different forms of property? You know? And uh, I'm uh, uh, immediately thinking of, well, look, I mean, what is this? What is property, either public or private? I mean, uh, what is, uh, uh, I mean, we do have a first act of violence, a first act of uh, occupation, a first act of um, uh, might, um, that crystallizes them into something which is property and exclusion. Does public property contain, does public property contain these elements as well as private property? So if it does, does um, uh, is public property really radically different from private property when we talk about the uh, founding uh, you know, social relations there, if you uh, ask this. I, mean, I don't know. Uh, what I know is that uh, um, I've seen the commons, uh, probably, you know, uh, utopianly, as you say, it as something that challenges that, that challenges this first right of mind. I was the first come, or now I'm the, po the most powerful, and that is why I have the property, you know, I retain <coughs> The title of property. So and this is so true for the public. Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Is it? Who, who, yeah, who has stolen from the first, who has said, this is mine. He was the originator of injustice in the world. Now, what I see and uh, what I think uh, also didn't uh, expand upon, didn't even uh, see, uh, you know, uh, with all uh, its possibilities, is that uh, the commons challenge that. They challenge the crystallization, and that is why we should introduce the element of time. There's nothing static there. The crystallization of this act uh, uh, of right of mind. Okay, they do. How do they do that? They, uh, if you want uh, a transactive term, they introduce an element of loan. I have it on loan by my neighbors, and that is why I have a social mortgage on it. I have it on loan. Uh, by my children, and that is how, uh, that is why I have uh, a generational mortgage on it. You know. So, property should not be excluded by this discourse, and uh, I think it is in fact the first word to be mentioned. It is where we should act you know, to say, look, this is a new radical view of uh, human relations. This is. Uh, uh, by far, uh, the only future we have in a peaceful uh, way uh, on this uh, earth, overcrowded, you know. I mean, okay. uh, May I ask you yeah. a question? So, what I'm confused with property is, we know that in, in, in Marx and economics, in, economics in, in general, uh, for example, let's say we own all the capitalist firms of the world, and over, let, let's say it's owned by the global society. If it's still running for, on profit basis, competing with each other and extracting surplus, i.e. profits in form of rent, interest, yeah. or You are not uh, respecting banking. your loan, uh, which is intergenerational, that way, for instance. Can you see? I mean, uh, I, I, that's no, why you use time. Uh, no, because on, the, on, on, on daily basis and on, on kind of annual basis, like for example, the way we look at statistics is annual looking at, at production. Um, there is a, that's why I do surplus. There is surplus. There is more. When we introduce division of labor and scientific work and technology, there is division. And, and there is extra labor left on the side. That labor can be used for us enjoying ourselves. I, the way Marx and Engels occasionally wrote about communism, you know, leisure, fishing, reading, poetry. Or we may need three jobs because we live in neoliberal Britain or, or US, where you need often people with three jobs to survive because they need it. We you know, just to buy for basic goods and, and pay for this. So I think without discourse on surplus, i.e., production, that's then monetized in some way, or that's explained as surplus labor, so it doesn't have to be always monetized, but without money, we don't have a theory of, of value. I don't see how property on its own can give us a cycle of reproduction, reproduction of wealth. We have one generation then that it reproduces itself to another generation. In between, we have commodities, and we have far more commodities than Marx at this time, or than any classical economist gets. So, you know, it's, we are challenged by the amount of and volume and flow of commodities. There's too much, we know this, that's why the ecological crisis is hitting us. So, what I'm saying is that flow from generation to generation goes in a form of an object. Currently, it's commodities and public sector outputs uh, that are, by the way, it's not about state. 
It can be local. I mean, a lot of local authorities run it, uh, but but it's not right. But if we say that anything that's produced in any form that's within a capitalist society as such is capitalism, and that you know, it's it's a blank check to anyone to say anything. So nothing is ever right if we say first civilized production, civilized I mean large volume, large scale was capitalist production. Then we say if anything that enters that they may change it one day. It's simply capitalism. That's it. We kill any possible discussion. You know, enemy always wins. There comes the capitalism once and for good. There was capitalism. That's why I asked: Are there germs? Are there elements? Are there, is there something in common that you guys see that may destabilize? Destabilize? And you, you, you admitted the last at the end of your comment that, that maybe we, we need maybe to think about elements that can change. But what I'm saying is, if we think about those elements as products, I commodities, socially specific products then you can see there are products of output, monetized labor, that are not commodities. They're called public sector outputs. And you know, I'm not, I'm not a fan of statism per se, that the state can impose whatever it wishes on, on its citizens. But surely if half of citizens' wealth is produced and given according to need, look, it was distribution according to need. It is treated as a, as a, as a product. I mean, say, all, all these state sectors, because you look at the GDP, what is counted in the GDP, it's all this, this products of the, of the public sector and elements of the GDP. So these are not cents. Exactly. But they're counted because capitalists, capitalists recognize their value, their wealth. They should be counted. I, I apologize, I, um, but yeah. we have to give the word yes, first to Professor yeah. Babich, and then we can no, continue no, no. the second That's round. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, please, Professor, give uh, your That's okay with me, we'll but uh, I suppose, uh, I suppose yeah. we, sh we should move. Uh, uh, okay. We should move uh, on. I understood that the second round is uh, more really a discussion and, and a question, uh, question raising. And uh, uh, I'll add only a short addition to what I previously said and then uh, have uh, two questions, one to all and the other to Giuseppe. Uh, first, uh, short addition. Uh, we are entering the time when uh, the economy uh, uh, is to be defined as uh, with the following uh, clause or maxim. It's easy to produce, it's uh, difficult to sell. Anything that could be sold uh, uh, will find its market. That's the, uh, sen uh, the, the purpose of my examples that I mentioned, uh, human organs, etc. Uh, things that, are, uh, uh, that were not uh, object of selling and buying uh, in the past, but uh, at, uh, at the point in time when uh, something like that becomes affordable, uh, usually meaning uh, uh, cheap enough and, and uh, safe enough, uh, it becomes irresistible. And then we have production of the, those uh, uh, by markets, as it, as it were. One uh, other uh, implication of that is that uh, uh, to be payable uh, for anything, uh, you have to have uh, uh, big numbers of buyers. There is a, uh, a, a chronic shortage of buyers in the world. And uh, it seems to me that in the future, uh, the, bi uh, the bigger uh, numbers are the better because of the shortage of, of buyers. So uh, nations will uh, fare better uh, than smaller ones just because uh, uh, of the sheer numbers, because they uh, could afford uh, lower or smaller margins of profit. Uh, questions. The, uh, the, both of them are, in some sen uh, sense, uh, connected with that. Uh, first, uh, it's been mentioned international solidarity, and we may see that uh, there is no international, real international solidarity in the sense that we have redistributive schemes within na national economic schemes. Uh, I think there, there is no place in the world that uh, those who are not capable to work w would be let to die from hunger, for example, because of those redistributive uh, schemes with the national states. But uh, on the international level, uh, a nation could die from hunger or star starve uh, because there is no such a, a, a redistributive scheme of solidarity on the international level. Uh, and my question is, how uh, do you uh, conceive 
uh, or what kinds of distributive schemes you conceive to be there on the international level to be appropriate to uh, function uh, at least as well as uh, domestic uh, redistributive uh, schemes of solidarity function now uh, providing the care even for those who never worked and never will work. Uh, the second question is for Giuseppe uh, directly. Uh, you, mentioned, you said that corporations are not mortal. How is that? As a form of life, uh, they should be mortal, as all other forms of life, individual or collective, individual, per individual persons, families, nations, civilizations, all of them are mortal. Life is mortal. Why corporations would be exception? Thank you very much. So I now first give the word to Professor Vlasic if he wants to respond to Tony Krug's latest question and then to Mr. Wilson. Yes, I think I'm not sure what was the question to you. I don't know. I think you said quite well. Yeah, then, then we, may, we can give the word to Giuseppe to respond to Professor Babic. Because they, are, because they are angels, you see? Corporations are angels, so that's why they're immortal. I mean, uh, 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 that is the, uh, the point. They don't have a you know, uh, physical life, and we invented a life for them on their behalf. They are... Um, Fictional subjects, if you want, juridical subjects, empowered by law. Artificial, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, this uh, changes, you know, the game. The rule of the game was that at some point, I die, you die, and there is a problem of succession, you know, which imposes, you know, other rules and regulations which are, are not in place for uh, corporations. I uh, want to. Uh, get back on uh, some of the issues, uh, production and surplus, uh, and, and surplus uh, for instance, and uh, the two words uh, are uh, possible, uh, it is possible to apply to them adjectives. You know? And uh, this, does this, uh, you know, uh, change the word, for instance, if I apply extractive surplus to a mode of production, or if I apply generative surplus to a mode of production, does this change you know, the matter uh, in theoretical terms? Does it? I mean, this is a question that I'm uh, asking myself. Uh, you know, possibly it does. And it does relate to uh, different modes of production, which uh, in uh, their turn relate to uh, different, uh, if you want, forms of property, of uh, uh, different uh, social relations as well. And this would partly answer uh, your question, uh, perhaps. Uh, you know. uh, another thing on uh, redistribution uh, gets again back to one of the two uh, poles of this uh, discussion, which is uh, the commons. You know. uh, a fair redistribution of um, goods, space, whatever, can't do uh, without a, uh, a protection and a generative protection of um, primary goods which allow you as a human being to develop you know, yourself uh, as a person. Okay? You know, water is that, for instance. It is even recognized by now by many uh, declarations of the United Nations of the subjects which are kind of usually vague about uh, what is the uh, material right of the, of the peoples. You know. uh, so uh, the first thing you should say is uh, a fair redistribution of whatever, uh, wealth, uh, production, goods, commodities, you can even make it, is impossible without a fair handling of water as a global commons. Fair, fair seems to be too strong. Uh, can I, is, uh, can no. I may, may make uh. an example which is kind of, uh, you know, um, I live in Turin. In Turin, there are these beautiful little fountains. They are green in color. 
you know, uh, they are uh, called Tourette, which means a small bull, okay? And everybody can have access, irrespective of their income, or even ir uh, irrespective of their temporariness in the, uh, the city, to water, you know? What I ask myself is, why this is not applied to food? Although uh, being of Christian, let's say, heritage, uh, excuse me, <laughs> I don't want to make it up, uh, water and food are always associated. You give water to the thirsty, and you give food to the hungry, you know. Why is it that in Piazza San Carlo, in the center of Turin, I'm allowed as a, uh, let's say, petit bourgeois with my two children to have free water if I want, not to get to a bar, for instance, okay? And I'm not allowed to have free food, you know. And again, I think that, uh, uh, you know, uh, these uh, elements are the ones that uh, are uh, the principles of any fair redistribution. What you have to do is you have to dissociate water and food as basic you know, needs from uh, commodi uh, commodization, okay? Irrespective of your capacity of income or even of your capacity of work, of your capacity of social contribution, you are entitled to water and food. If you make it a general rule, you know, uh, you make it a revolutionary rule as well, you know, because, it, I mean, I would say that uh, some of the wars that we will see in future will be there because we haven't solved this, basically. And who is the, the actor I, in this course? sharing I, everything to everyone? Can, who are you, the campesinos? Can I, America, you'd like to respond? Uh, uh, can I respond? Uh, my question actually was the, uh, the lack of uh, the redistributive sch solidarity schemes on the international level. Uh, the example that you gave uh, regarding hunger, uh, is not good enough for that question. It's very good uh, in other uh, uh, ways. Uh, to, be, uh, rec to receive uh, uh, aid uh, in eating issues, you have to qualify uh, as such. So, but you won't be let uh, to die from hunger within national schemes. Of course, you have to buy your, your food, but if you are not able to buy that food, you won't be uh, let uh, to die uh, without food. There are some domestic uh, redistributive schemes of solidarity everywhere in all nations, in all states. There is no such a scheme on the international level. That, that was the point uh, that, that I, uh, I was. Regarding the corporations, uh, they are obviously artificial persons, but in my view, but that's, that's uh, perhaps something that might lead us uh, in, in other direction. Uh, families or, or nations or, or political parties or civilizations or religions uh, also are uh, collective identities with some capacity to bear responsibility for what they do and uh, living a, a life, sometimes very short life, of, as the conference, uh, this, uh, this conference this week, or a very long, uh, long living uh, collective uh, form of life, like let's say Jewish, peop Jewish nation, which is living 5,000 years or more. Uh, and if that's so for those collectives, not all collectives, but only those collectives that are forming or making a form of life. Uh, it seems to me that corporations are pretty much the same as artificial persons, and the proof for that is that they can be sued, they can bear responsibility, they can be praised or blamed for what they do in the way that it's not reducible to anything that anyone as an individual person has done within that. So if a company replaces a CEO, for example, uh, the uh, case at court will not stop at that, po uh, that point. The company will uh, be prosecuted as the company, not as those set of persons that were making that company at some previous uh, point in time. That's making them uh, continuous in their existence. And there are, in my view, enough evidence that we can call those evidence, uh, that, that evidence to be a symptom of some kind of what I call life. So 
they are not immortal in that sense. Uh, angels, angels, uh, yeah, unlike extraterrestrials or, or, or uh, uh, robots, uh, which seems to be very well located within the frame of time, uh, whatever they are, and uh, independently of the issue if they exist or not, uh, angels, uh, there's a big question there, and the, the question is metaphysical. Yeah, well, it's uh, not part of it. That, that's the, the, <laughs> but that, that's the, with the definition of mortality, uh, uh, they are not uh, mortal because they are not uh, existing within the time. Thank you very much. So now, um, I think that the argument uh, between Tony Prug and Professor Vazic is quite crucial. So I would now interrupt and ask for a point of clarification. So as far as I understand, Tony Prug is arguing that um, if a large part of the uh, socioeconomic product in a given society is not produced for profit, but is produced for public redistribution on the basis of individual needs, then it doesn't really matter whether a system uh, is to be called capitalist in its overarching structure or not. This is a, a route towards a more just society, increasing the proportion of such kind of product relative to the one produced for profit. Whereas Professor Lazic seems to me to be arguing that it actually does matter very much whether the overarching system of socioeconomic reproduction is capitalist, even though a large part of the product is produced for public redistribution. So my, my question to Professor Lazic is, is that because you consider uh, a social democratic system to be unstable over the long run, and because it has proven historically that such systems, that within such systems, this proportion of publicly produced goods tends to be eroded over time. So the only way towards a just society is the transformation of the whole socioeconomic system. I'm the, the rise of social democracy to power should be put in the, te in the framework of, of, of time, of social relations in, after the Second World War, mostly. And uh, I mean, the, the, the increase on one hand, the decreasing uh, capitalism at, at that time uh, in, in economic and, and social terms and increasing power, strength of the, of, the, of the working class of working, working class organizations of unions and of political parties and this was uh, I mean but the, the general idea was uh, supported by the by the successes of the capitalist accumulation at, at that time so the, the more productive the system was the more uh, the larger part of the accumulation could be redistributed, but with what goal? This is the this is the ultimate uh, uh, question. With what, what was the goal of redistribution? Was this was the goal uh, making the uh, living conditions of the majority of people, of all the people, better, or was the ultimate goal of this redistribution to make the working uh, force uh, more productive in, in the <laughs> system of capitalist accumulation? That was the. That was the question. When, when, this, when the, the system changed in, in, in the way that, uh, that uh, the power of the work class, this is not due to, first of all, in my view, by, uh, due, due to the globalization. And the working class power in, in, in working class organizations, in, in, in parties and unions, uh, was, was uh, going down. I mean, then the system of redistribution could be reduced. Then you, you could. Uh, minimize the, the proportion of the, or, or the, 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 the lower the proportion of the state, uh, state property in the national economies, and uh, not to change, as, as in, in during the 50s or 60s, not to change uh, the, the com complete uh, way of, of uh, system reproduction. So, I mean, if you go, the, 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 and, and another basic point is, if you go on with, with statization, if you if you if you make everything state property, you will not get prisons for society of free people and equal people. I mean, you will get another form of, of slavery, so to say, or another form of class society, and because that was real socialism. So the agent is wrong. The, 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 having an idea that with the state you will abolish what relationship and domination is basically wrong and very dangerous. Because we have historical confirmation that the end of process of statization uh, is the, the new type of social domination. 
And then that's the, I mean, the final argument. Yes, and then we'll, we'll open the discussion to the audience. So, yes. um, it's correct, I'm up for the portion of the total wealth, total surplus being distributed according to need. The original socialist motto in France, actually, later taken on by communists, was for, from everyone according to ability to everyone according to need. Uh, I don't think that overall system, like you said, is irrelevant. It's crucial. But there is a struggle. There's a struggle between two modes of production. I'm not sure they can even be called modes of production because perhaps Marx was right to call the overall thing mode of production. But there is some other thing called production of a different kind within this thing that struggles with. And you are wrong that it's being eroded because stats are showing that Wagner, who Marx uh, actually wrote letters with late, late in his life, Wagner's law, was right. The state, the overall state production still cumulatively in the world grows. The public sending in GDP is growing. But what is happening is that neoliberals figured out to insert uh, private production within it, commodities. So, for example, health is delivered according to needs still, but there are private companies within that overall delivery making profits and inserting capitalist production in it, taking profits as a slice of it. So what I'm saying is that once we introduce different objects of, of products, different outputs, not being just commodities, it's something else, something I call them egalities because I need to work in my own world to, to figure out what to do with it. Once you, then you have a conflict, okay, capitalists want profit, and there's something, some other logic at play which wants to distribute according to need, which was the original socialist and communist principle, and what workers uh, movements fought for. And why, you know, if, if the thesis is completely wrong that this matters, why is it then when privatization come, comes on the new wave, like now in the UK, you have people on the streets? Why are 250,000 people on the streets of London a few days ago? Why do they struggle against cuts? Obviously, they see something from their workers' position valuable in this allocation according to need. And most of them are not happy about statism, I agree with it, but that's a different sort of problem. State is a form of organization that's a capitalist primary, I agree. But within it, there's something else that happens as well. Let's not talk about. Thanks. Uh, now we will open the discussion for the general public. So uh, I think Professor Matei had a question first. to make 
capital is more humane as compared to the other thing, it doesn't matter. The truth of the matter is that today we need, we need to factor within the picture what new acquisitions we know, uh, what is new that we know today we didn't know at the time of Marx nor at the time of the, of, of the traditional Marx, Marxist thinking, and that is the quality relationship, the long-term relationship, the community, and all the sort of different quality-based relationships that are post-capitalist, that are not capitalist anymore. I disagree completely that if you are a factory owned by workers in Argentina that has recovered after a catastrophe, you are anyway a capitalist institution. That's not true. You're a commons institution. If you occupy a theater and you run it out of solidarity and out of you know, a, a, a coherent struggle against the organized way in which the cultural business is running a state, you are not another capital institution, you're a commons institution. So you're something completely different. I totally agree with you that uh, Elinor Ostrom is, an, is not a tall revolutionary thinking, but who said that? If someone said that Elinor Ostrom, do you think if a revolutionary thinker will get the Nobel Prize? Come on, I mean, this is just not serious, okay? The point is, Ostrom had a role in making the Commons agenda again palatable to people that otherwise would consider them dangerous socialism within the McCarthyist ideology that is still holds in American academia. Okay, so she has a role from that point of view. In other experiences, Commons grew out of different struggles. In Italy, there were lawyers who put the, the Commons on the ground. You know, they were not even struggles. There were a bunch of lawyers that said, look, there is an imbalance between the private and the public, this is a problem with, with liberal democracy, we have to cure this imbalance, how we do that? Let's organize some institutions that are shielded from the possibility of being privatized. And those are the commons. And there is where, where the commons entering the agenda in Italy. As they were in Chiapas, or you know, you name it, or in Bolivia, you know, the commons came out of different struggles. Now, is there some principle behind this kind of struggle? that are genuinely anti-capitalist in their possibility to develop, that can be organized as a system thinking that is alternative to the single thought of believing that nothing can be changed of the current capital system of production. It doesn't mean to, that you have to be optimistic. I think there's nothing more stupid than being optimistic when you, when, and, and this is another vice of the book of Collier and, 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 and Silke, you know, because if you read that book, it looks like the world is already revolutionary. And the, the more we talk about the common, the more privatization goes on. Okay? As much as the more we talk about, you know, kind of shared uh, economies and, uh, and, and, you know, and, and transformation, the more what is happening is that corporate capitalism is becoming hard and violent and brutal. The more Podemos is strong in Spain, the more the, 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 the right wing government is, is hitting hard. Okay? And the more uh, Syriza is getting strong in, 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 in Greece the more the Troika is getting harsh. So this, this, is, this is politics, okay, this is the relation to politics. Do we need a different grammar? Can we have that? Do we need to have a rhetoric that factors in future generations, <coughs> the things that we have to care about something different than extracting and producing and dealing with some sort of different, you know, uh, scope of our very life experience in the world? And this is what the Commons is about. And it's not just theory, it's a bunch of practice that requires some theory to be understood, and the theory requires a lot of practice to make any sense. So I, 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 would be, I think it's, an, it's not historically correct to say it was already out there. Maybe the Commune of Paris was an example of common, it probably it was, it lasted very short. We had historical experiences, but today the matter is, do we have some sort of guideline for a transformative thinking that allows us to survive a little longer than the next seven years or eight years in which you know the conditions of reproduction of life on this earth will guarantee for us. That's it. Thank you, Professor Matei. Uh, we'll take all the questions and then we will have the answers by the body, by the participants. So, Tamash. Uh, um, <clears throat> uh, at the risk of sounding very old-fashioned. Uh, which I hate, but I do. Uh, I would respectfully ask you to remember that the difference or the distinction between the market and the state and the private and the public are not identical. And second, 
I don't think that the markets and capitalism are identical. Just think of so-called real socialism. Real socialism, indeed, distribution and redistribution were largely, not completely, but largely taken over by state authorities, while commodity production and wage labor went on unabated. And therefore, the horizon of capitalism hasn't been transcended by real socialism, and that's its main reason for having failed. So therefore, you know, uh, the attempt to reduce uh, production for the market in order to produce for the needs would indeed undoubtedly humanize society and it's a worthwhile attempt to reform capitalist society. But one of the reasons of the misery in this world is not only caused by distribution, it's caused also by the nature of work, the nature of labor, and it's a primary cause, if I'm not very much mistaken, of alienation and reeducation. So, uh, even if goods, be they public or not, produced under such circumstances, in which the teleology of work is still determined by external factors, it will remain, will remain alienated labor, and therefore the problem of the socialist perspective is not put on the table by this approach. It may be a valuable approach. I'm very much sympathetic with what Tony Proust is saying. I really do think that, that, that indeed an element of uh, satisfying the needs without the mediation of the market would be indeed necessary if we don't want to pick the bucket. You know, okay, yes. But this is not only a question of life and death, but there is also a question of what kind of a life. Thanks very much. Uh, there was a comment there or a question. Yes, I had a question for the first speaker. <coughs> Your argument also reminds the anarchist argument from the column. And uh, the anarchist argument of the column is also presented as a alternative, as a post capitalist way of, uh, of having a property. For example, the uh, Occupy movement has anarchist elements, and the Zapatista movement is presented like a model of anarchist way of organizing life, so how do you really argue that anarchists you want to come? Right. Uh, yeah, just, just a small question for Tony, and this is the speech that I heard a few times now. Uh, I think that your notion that state production is the production for the need is not a scientific notion. That means it is not a notion that understands the social relations reproduced by the state production would mean that it is not a production for the need, but a production that, while uh, satisfying some needs of a part of society, even majority, is reproducing a hierarchical relation of, uh, uh, of uh, a part of society that, uh, that is within the state and uh, the other that is not, which is, which is a, a unequal uh, uh, relation of power. So, uh, and in this sense, I would say that Marx wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't say that today reading Marx to criticize uh, state production is to say it's capitalist, but is to say it's not directly social. For Marx, it wasn't uh, capitalism that is the only wrong society, as we know. Uh, but the problem is that uh, it wasn't direct. Uh, that uh, capitalism is indirectly social. In this, in this sense, state production is also indirectly social, as uh, the society that particip uh, participants of society that participate in production within society are not at the same time uh, the ones that determine the needs and the allocation uh, of, of labor within society if, uh, if it's state production. In, in the state production, they are just the receivers at that point. And this is not production for the need, directly uh, social production for the need. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, you had a question? Yes? Yeah, uh, I think that 
what Sasha made a point about something in the sir who asked the question was um, really important about it. It looked like um, uh, Brooks said at one point uh, when you call everything cap capitalism, you kill discussion. I think this discussion here had a similar problem that you didn't call everything capitalism, but uh, it wasn't clear what you're calling capitalism. Uh, Professor Lazic seemed to be talking about the sphere of production, you seem to be talking about sphere of allocation, totally different spheres. So, wh where is the capitalism? What if you have, like uh, Professor Lazic men mentioned, the relations of domination, Sasha hierarchical relations, uh, the gentleman mentioned wage labor. So, what if we have a society that uh, produces for needs but still has relations of domination in the workplace? Or the other way around. We destroy the relations of domination in the workplace but produce for profits. Which of those is capitalism? Or both? Or neither? Thanks. And you had the last question. But of course it's not the end of the story. 
because then you have to introduce the, the theme of the commons in the failure of that system. That is the fact that even the, that surplus was managed, but, but uh, 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 not through the real possibility of the direct actors, workers, that is the, the conductors and the con conduits, I mean, and, uh, and that is the, the fact that even what was commune, the element of communes, which, which did exist, and the element of non-capitalist system, which did exist, <coughs> were confronted to a social relationship, which didn't permit, really, uh, a, this, a mode of decision-making on how to produce and how to distribute according to needs. Thanks. So we have around 10 more minutes. All the questions were either for Tony Poole or for Professor Lazic, so I will invite the two of them to respond, uh, each one around five minutes if possible. So first, Tony. Uh, first, to respond to Tamash, I, I completely agree that with state production, nothing is, nothing is sold at the level of uh, alienation, wage, labor. I mean, look, I see it as a, it's a, it's a development. I mean, Lebo is for, for me the best book on this topic. It's how the, it, the socialism and, and communism as an ultimate goal are fights for development of human beings. And developing simply wealth is not enough. I mean, who wants to sit in someone you know, in a state managed office having everything given for you, you know, allocated according to the That wouldn't be, you know, that wouldn't be. Uh, but with state or public production or some other form that, that may, we may call something else on the state one day. We can make collective decisions, which we cannot with private property. When corporations or individuals own things, we can't make them. We can regulate them through, through states. Uh, regulation is something different with, with uh, public, some, some form of, I'm not sure how to call it, the public is not the right word, the state is not the right word, I don't know, we need that some word. But no doubt, I, I fully agree that hierarchical, decisions, hierarchical uh, relations of work, the social relations, as, as Sasha called it, that remain within public production do not make it truly for the need. Because if they were truly for the need, people would say, well, how about we work in public sector three days a week? How about we do not sign contracts with corporates we don't like? How about we have workers' councils in public sector? You have none of them. So of course, the human element, that wage labor element in public sector is almost entirely now being copied from, from private sector, from corporates. And it didn't used to be that way. And when you say that, uh, uh, when was it said? Someone said, uh, I'm at least, hey, oh, alienated labor. Look, if you've lived long enough in the UK, as we've been living up for nearly 10 years, people were so proud. I couldn't figure it out when we moved, when they were for public sector. We always, why are people so proud if they were for public sector? Because they were not alienated in the same way as those in the private sector, though they were both alienated. Those in public sector knew that. Their public sector was like a result of their fathers and grandfathers' fight on the streets, dying, minor strikes, you know. These were long, long strikes. You know, you see, you see if you go into workmen's places, you will find planes and marks, you know, and angles and, and red flags and hammer and sickle. It's still rare if, if you look hard enough. They knew that history find its spirit in public sector, and that spirit was limited, of course, very limited. So I, I would say everything, all those comments about alienation, hierarchy, you're all right. But with public sector and with some form of democratic uh, self-governance, if you want, these things are much easier to change than when private ownership and you know fictional corporations own things. So that's what I would say. That's why I like this direction. Uh, but one major, major uh, 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 thing where I clearly wasn't uh, well, I wasn't clear enough because uh, it's something that still, uh, I mean, the work is ongoing uh, on daily basis. Is surplus. It's not distribution. It's like it's mantra. I mean, I hope I live long enough to repeat it for long enough and that I write enough papers to convince people. But like kind of, you know, repeat yourself, it's not distribution. Public sector allocation or any kind of, you know, highly technologically advanced it is because how? Because it's not about surplus value. Marx knew only about surplus value because he see no surplus producing public sector. There was none. How can he see something that didn't exist? So let's leave man in his grave and look at empirical data, which is what, what he did when he was alive. He looked at, let's look at him, 49% in GDP is public sector. That's what in e, e, e 15, e, EU15, that's what countries said. In OECD, 41% of all final products are public sector. Now, a large part of that is uh, uh, transfers. We pay for pensions, you give people money to spend on markets, that's just 
by the transfers. But the quarters is subject to production, so it is production. The only difference is it is no profit. It is no profit driven. And you pay for those products in advance, a year in advance, and you print money. And actually, taxes in, in at least in UK history, taxes in bank, how Bank of England came to be, taxes are money spent in advance, and then it's withdrawn from the circulation in order to to, to uh, stop inflation. So it is not the good old liberal story. Oh, we make money in public sector, in, in private sector, then we give it to the state, and then you spend on your workers. No, because we know even from classical Marxist analysis, the source of actually, we know that capitalist sector to survive needs educated workers, needs healthy workers. So no, 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 no. These are two parallel productions which are funded in advance, both of them. One with example and monetary creation, you create money in order to put the public sector and then you withdraw. So these are products, this is not distribution. And in the, the, the letter of the Soviet uh, economists from 44, clearly says we produce surplus labor. And if you think of kindergarten, Ten, okay, ten parents agree and, and one takes care of the children. Nine of them can do something else. That's surplus labor. Why? Because one is taking care of ten children instead of one. Very simple, surplus labor. You make it a company, now it's surplus by you. You make it a public sector, now it's allocated according to need. So it has a new form. So social form of production, that is the way to look at things for me that's key to understand uh, what maybe, maybe we can change because, I mean, no doubt capital is doing and it's in certain private production even into distribution and allocation of uh, public sector products and goods. And yes, we need new grammar, that's why I'm trying, you know, I'm hoping and reading with hope the common literature, trying to find this new grammar. But I'm afraid it's not going to be legal. Legal is one aspect of it. It has to be production and about alienation and a lot more what I didn't talk about, but you all completely rightly corrected me, which is production of human beings that self-determine and that dictate how they live together, which is what you can't do within capitalist public sector. So even public sectors have their differences, and we couldn't do it even in socialist public sector, because party as a mechanism of self-governance was not good enough. It was not good enough. So that's for me. Thanks. And Professor Vaz? I, I will defend my position with much less energy than that. <laughs> uh, just, just a few few words. Uh, maybe maybe we, we had to start with, uh, uh, with the with the concept of capitalism. What do we think when we say capitalism? And it's, this is not uh, it, it cannot be reduced with the concept of capitalism to one simple standpoint, like uh, capitalism is accumulation for the sake of accumulation. This is not enough. There are several elements also that should be, that we have, have, have to put into the definition. One of these things is the separation, of course, of, of the producers from the means of production, but also separation of producers from other producers. This is necessary condition, and, and the separation from producers from the users. These all things are necessary for, uh, for the capitalism to, uh, as, 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 a, as a specific system of social uh, production or, or, or reproduction. As long as we have all these elements, we have capitalism. Inside capitalism, uh, this is where Katrin Samari is right. Within capitalism, the different things are coming into being, which has, has a kind of resistance toward the system. But what is unique with capitalism, and very different from the socialist, real socialism, is this what we may call the volatility of capitalism. You are the uh, protest against capitalism and then you become the commodity inside of capitalism. Like, uh, I don't know, uh, many things, Bob Dylan, for example, many, or many other people, or many other move, social movements, or many other, many other things. And this is, I mean, this is why you have to warn every, every time that uh, in each, in each uh, uh, original non capitalist initi initiative, there is a uh, that seed of, cap seed of capitalism, which can, and that everything can be transformed and in order to fit to the capitalist relations. So, it, it is not true that, that uh, working communities are something quite completely different from capitalist enterprise. It is not. What they produce, how they survive, it's very, from, it depends on the, on, the, on the point of view. If you look from the, from the point of view of the workers, this is a completely different thing. As long as the, the company becomes profitable at the market, 
and has something to redistribute to the, to the workers or to pay at least to pay salary, base wages and salaries. Then it, it, from the other point of view, from the point of view of the functioning of the economy as a, as a whole, this is a capitalist enterprise, not something quite different. Except for, of course, the point of view of employees is ex extremely important. It is, but it is not the only point of view, and we have to see what is going to happen with the unit of production, which is enterprise, no matter how it is organized. This is a workers shareholding is very, very old this, uh, thing. It exists for hundreds of years, but it, and it could not change the, the basis of capitalist production. Uh, why, generally, there was a very old, I mean, very old, almost like myself, I mean, 46, 50 years, 50 years or something like this, uh, idea of, of, uh, of, uh, the, of, the, of the role of the state in capitalist economy. Where states enters capitalist economy, in what spheres it enters capitalist economy. In spheres which are not yet profitable, and in spheres which has stopped to be profitable. And when the state reconstructs, if, they, if it succeeds in reconstructing these fields of economy like transportation, then it will go, will move back and let capitalist production to be utilized in an international way. So this is this volatility, this fantastic volatility of capitalism, <coughs> which, is, which is the main source of its strength, I, 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 I would say. Uh, okay, that will be it. Thank you. And I would like to once again thank all the participants for their contributions to the roundtable and thanks to the audience as well for the questions and that would be it.